isn't this an incredible looking creature? If you don't know what this is, this is a mayfly nymph. And I know at certain times of year, specifically around May, funnily enough, you tend to get an awful lot of fuss and attention paid to the mayfly. And that's because the hatches are incredible. But just remember that for the rest of their life cycle, this is what a mayfly looks like, or for much of it anyway. An incredible looking nymph which darts around uh, in all sorts of interesting areas on the river and in still waters, particularly around kind of silty beds and things like that. This is where these nymphs tend to hatch and tend to live. And that's what the fish are used to seeing. So when they go up through the water column um, in the English summertime, uh, at the early part in May, and start to turn into those incredible insects that we see flying around in enormous swarms sometimes, the fish go a little bit loopy. But there are occasions when this nymph is what you need to fish. Now this is slightly controversial because a lot of people consider that you shouldn't fish with a mayfly nymph. You should just wait until the hatch happens and fish it as a dry. Absolutely fine. Um, I think that kind of verdict comes from a, a previous era when perhaps there weren't quite so many fish in the river, certainly not stocked fish. And it was probably more difficult to actually catch the trout. And one of the issues here, of course, is that often catch and release wasn't practiced back in the day. So now when fish are returned, it's probably okay to fish a nymph. Fish a nymph. That's my verdict anyway. I mean, it's, you make your own mind up about what you want to do, but I particularly think that this is a really effective way of fishing. Particularly sometimes you might find on a day when there are loads and loads of mayfly hatching, you won't get takes. And that sounds completely mad because there's so much coming off the river. Um, and you'll see, you know, birds flying around and all sorts of stuff eating the mayfly, but the fish won't be rising on the actual mayfly. The reason is, if there are loads and loads of these nymphs hatching in the water, what's a fish going to do? Is it going to make the effort to rise? Is it going to show itself to a potential predator? Or is it going to stay in the safety and the slightly deeper water and eat the nymphs as they're emerging? And I think you can probably work out the answer for yourself. Even if there are fish rising, a trout will eat 90% of its diet subsurface. So that's why I think it's a really useful tactic to have this in your armory. So in the vise, quite a big fella this, um, I've got a streamer hook. Now what you're looking at is something like a Hanak 900 or a 950 BL, something that's nice and big. This is a size 12 and at the head I've mounted um, a three and a half millimeter gold uh, disco bead basically, so one that's got the little flat spots that catches the light. My tying thread for this is again Semperfly Nano Silk. This is beige and that's basically to match the colour of the virtual nymph skin which I'm going to use to form the body of this fly. Um, a couple of different dubbings going in. This one is a lovely camely coloured dubbing from Michael Zappal. Uh, it's really lovely, it's got um, really sort of woolly feel to it and it's also got little flashes of UV in it which um, catch the light which is very attractive. For the thorax area I'm using a trout stalker scruffy dubbing, this is boosted natural. Okay, let's get on with the tie. So tying thread going on. I mean this is a big insect isn't it? An inc incredibly interesting looking creature and actually imagine if this thing was three foot long and you saw it walking along you'd run a mile. They're terrifying looking things look like something out of Alien or something like that. You could spend ages on this sort of pattern um, tying it into a sort of a realistic looking creature and trying to replicate all those incredible gills and things like that that you see on the real insect. But to be honest, I found all you need to do is put a representation in and what you'll then get is the fish willing to eat them. What you're trying to do is replicate profile and size here, hence the, the big sort of hook of the size 12. So the other material I'm going to be using today is pheasant tail and that's to create that three prong tail. So I'm going to pull off three fibres of pheasant tail like so. Actually I've missed there so I'll do that again, one second. Just brush out three fibres of a light coloured pheasant tail, this one is. And I'm just going to rotate it round so they're facing upwards rather than facing down. And I'm just going to lay that on top and tie it in, catch it with my tying thread. And I'm just going to manoeuvre those around so they're all lying on top and you can already see that they're splaying out nicely. 
quite a long tail on this fly because it's trying to imitate the profile of the real insect. Just going to go down to the end and catch those all the way, just past the hook point. You can already see they're splaying, but I'm going to go underneath with a little pull and just kind of make a three pong tail. Now, because this is a slotted tungsten bead and this is a streamer hook, so it's not a jig hook, you've got a slight issue with the bead falling down. So what you've got to do is use the materials to make sure the bead stays at the head. And this is the first part of that process. So as I start to tie those fibers in, you'll notice that they make the, the bead sort of swing round and kind of pinch it to the front of the hook. A little bit fiddly. The more of these materials you put in, the more it embeds that bead. And you can just now see that the pheasant tail fibers are sitting at a right angle because they've gone inside the little slot at the front of the tungsten bead. So that's a helpful thing. Now the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to start to use these pheasant tail fibers to build up the profile of the kind of the fat bit of that incredible looking mayfly nymph. So I'm just gonna fold those fibers down and just take my thread back to about there and just do that a couple of times. Just keep folding it back and forward so you start to build up. Don't worry about the bead pinging around a little bit at this stage. It will hold in place, I promise you, eventually. But you can do this a couple of times, depending on the length of the pheasant tail fibre you've got. I've got one more in that, I think. There you go, just about. And again, you can see that it just kind of corrects the, the lay of that bead. And I'm just going to trim off those little ends of that pheasant tail. So I've got a little bit of a, a taper and an interesting shape at that thorax end. The next part of the process is to introduce a ribbing material. Now, what I'm using is something called Nymphit. This is a product that was designed actually for making tiny little nymphs. And essentially what I really like about this is, firstly, it's the right color. So it's kind of a darkish brown, but again, it's got that little bit of UV embedded in it. So a little bit of the violet color, which is very attractive. And I'm just gonna use that as my, my um, ribbing material. Just gonna, again, tie that in all the way to the end, keeping that nice taper all the way down this fly. I'm just gonna take another turn underneath those pheasant tail fibers just to make sure that they're kicking out nicely and tuck that into my spring to keep it out of the way while I tie the rest of the stuff in. So, next part of the process is to grab some nymph skin. You can use other colors, but I just find this is perfect. This is so similar to that real insect. And I'm gonna take a piece that's about inch and a half, two inches long because it's going to do two jobs here. I'm going to cut a really sort of shallow angle on the end of this skin, just so that it gives me a little bit to pinch in at the end. Introduce it to the top of the fly. And just using the, the fingernail on my index finger, so I'm left-handed tire, so right hand, but for you, if you're right-handed, left hand index finger, obviously. A couple of turns of thread over the top just to hold it in place. Make sure it's secure here because this is your kind of only chance to get this right really. Just to make sure that's nicely secured. Once you're happy, a couple of turns the other side. Okay, first part of the dubbing. So here's that um, whitey, creamy col colored um, sort of camel style dubbing from Michael Zapal, a brilliant Polish fly tire. Um, tie some incredible flies. Um, just a big pinch. It's not the easiest dubbing to, to get onto your thread, but actually using the ultra fine Semperfly stuff really helps with this because you can pinch it on and really give it a good squeeze around the, the thread. Just slide that up. You can add some more if you need to a little bit later on, but just catch on and then give it another turn just to hold it in place. And then you can start to build up that back end of the insect. 
Again, you notice from the real fly, it's very skinny at the back end and very bulky around the shoulders. So that's the profile I'm trying to achieve here. I'm just going to put a tiny little pinch more dubbing here, just to make sure that's um, as representative as I can get it. Again, you can squeeze quite hard to get that dubbing rope nice and tight. And then when I'm happy, I'm going to leave this bit open and I'm going to bring up my nymph skin for the back of the insect. So just stretch it a wee bit so it straightens out. Keeping some tension, I'll drop the bobbin over the top of the nymph skin. Like so. And just make sure it's straight. Keep correcting it with the other hand. And just really tie it down nice and hard so it's secure. Now, the next part of the process is I'm going to carry on with my tying thread, attaching the rest of this nymph skin up through the thorax area of the insect. Just make this is where you can really secure that bead down. So, if you can get your nymph skin to kind of sit into the recess like that, that gives you a, a really decent um, secure hold on that bead. And then go back down to there and now I'm going to bring up my rib so I'm just going to pop the the ribbing material out of my spring and in nice even turns I'm going to create that rib such a distinctive feature on both the mayfly and on the the nymph itself and doesn't that look great already that tapers lovely and it just squashes down that nymph skin and gives you a really realistic looking back area. So secure that down with the tying thread again. The reasoning I'm using this this Semperfly by the way and especially in this colour is that it really disappears really well inside this pattern. Just going to trim off there and then I'm just going to bring the tying thread up to the head of the fly this time and I'm going to create a dubbing loop. Now I am actually going to finish off the tie in the middle of the fly so rather than putting my um, whip finish at the head, the whip finish will happen in the middle of the fly. So the first thing is to form a loop, not a big one, but I'm just going to use two fingers, wrap my tying thread around it and just a couple of turns over the top to form a loop. And then what I do is I pop my bobbin around the other side of the vise so it's out of the way. And I'm going to spin some dubbing using this thing. Now this is a homemade dubbing spinner, which is essentially a coarse fishing plummet with a lure swivel. And I've clipped the hot top off of a hook. You can see all sorts of threads wound around it. This has spun a million bits of dubbing, but it just means that you can drop that onto your loop and it will hang so you can spin your dubbing. Now, as I said, boosted natural, really nice and spiky, all sorts of different colors. And I'm going to take a a decent pinch like so. I'm going to introduce that into that open loop. Just make sure it's nice and even. Slide it right up to the top. You don't want too much excess here. Then I'm going to, with my finger and thumb on my left hand, I'm going to pinch the bottom of the loop and then I'm going to spin that weight with the hook on it at the bottom. You can probably just see that in the bottom of the frame spinning around. And when I let go of it, it spins the dubbing into a lovely spiky rope. Just one more spin. Now what I can do is I can use that to turn that dubbing around the thorax area back towards the central portion of this fly. Perfect. And leave it there one more turn and then I can get my bobbin back again and just tie that off. like so, and trim away the bottom part of the loop. So that's nicely secure. I mean, look at it, it's springing out all over the place. Isn't that brilliant? Look at that. So just using my finger and thumb now, I'm just gonna try to brush down some of those outlandishly spiky fibers away from the, the area here. And I'm, I'm gonna pull the nymph skin back over the top in the thorax and just completely secure it in with my tying thread. So. Just brush it down, hold that about there, and then over the top with my tying thread like so. 
once you're happy that it's all nice and straight, give it a really good secure tie down. Then I can lift up and stretch the nymph skin, and get the scissors in right in the tips and clip it away. There we go. And now, using my whip finish tool, I can finish the fly off in the center. I know that's a bit unusual, but it's an effective way of doing it and it keeps everything nice and secure. You can put a dab of glue on it if you want. I tend to find with this stuff, you don't really need it. Just pull that nice and tight and trim away. Look at that, isn't that fantastic? So I can just trim away some of the more outlandishly spiky bits at the bottom if I want to. Just to tidy things up, but everything's pointing downwards. And to me, that's a really useful representation of the natural insect. The size of it's right. The kind of bulk of the fly in the profile is in the right places. You can, of course, tie it on a bigger streamer hook. So if you're in an area, wherever you are in the world, where you get really, really big mayfly, then of course you can tie it on a big hook, you know, a size four or size six streamer if you need to. But the, the kind of the idea, the principle behind it means that you get this, um, this kind of look. I and mean, of course you can go smaller as well. So there we are, that's the completed fly. I hope you've enjoyed the tie. I hope you get a chance to tie this one on and don't ignore the fact how effective this is as a fish, fish catching device uh, when you've got mayfly popping off all over the place. Because remember, wherever there are mayfly popping off, there are thousands of these things under the water's surface swimming around. Um, thanks ever so much for watching. Uh, give us a like, give us a subscription to the channel, and I'll see you again very soon.